Welcome to Team Rocket Garage. This is one of the biggest videos that I have been looking forward to for a long time. Everything that I know about the Panther platform. I have modified over 10 of these in all different formats. I've drifted them. I've gone off-road with them. If you like our videos, hit the like button, subscribe, and grab that popcorn because I've got one hell of a video for you today. This is everything I know about the Ford Panther platform. The Ford Panther platform was made from 1979 all the way till 2011. It went through three major revisions, first in 1990, then in 1998, and finally in 2003. The first generation of the Panther chassis cars, known to enthusiasts as the Box Panther, includes the Mercury Grand Marquis and the Crown Victoria, both of which were available in a coupe, a wagon, and a sedan. The Lincoln Town Car was a sedan only option, and the Lincoln Continental had a sedan and coupe option available from 1980 to 1983. In 1984, the Lincoln Continental transferred over to the Fox body chassis. Bye, All 1985 and onward, Box Panthers had the 5 liter V8 motor known as the Lopo. It was called the Lopo for its low power. You remember the 5.0 HO and the Fox body Mustang? Well, it's the same motor, but with way less power because of different heads, throttle body, fuel injectors, and cam. Before 1985, the horsepower rating was 130 horsepower from a 5 liter V8 motor. For 1985 and up, there was a towing option that added a transmission cooler and dual exhaust. This upped the horsepower to 150. The police package box Crown Vic might be the rarest Panther ever made as it had a 5.8 liter Windsor motor capable of 180 horsepower with all of the factory options in the towing package as well. In 1990, Ford started revising its Panther chassis cars into the aero body style as it's known by enthusiasts. First with the 1990 Lincoln Town Car, and then in 1992 with the Crown Victoria and Mercury Grand Marquis. The Panther chassis dropped all coupe and wagon options in the 1990 year and forward from there. Another major change from the 1990 Town Car and 1992 Mercury Grand Marquis and Ford Crown Victoria was the replacement of the 5 liter motor. The first one to get the new 4.6 overhead cam was the Lincoln Town Car. That old 140 horsepower 5 liter V8 was not fit for any sort of performance. The new overhead cam 4.6 had 190 horsepower. Whoa, calm down, Jamal. And this motor was dubbed the modular two valve. If you wanna know more about this motor, there's a link in the description. I made a video on that too. This new, smooth, efficient motor made 190 horsepower out of the box and no one knew that Ford was testing this engine for the still yet to come 1996 Mustang GT. In 1995, the body style for all the aero cars changed just a little bit with revision to headlights, taillights, grill and some styling. As well as all of these body improvements was the new and improved 4.6 modular now known as the NPI motor. The 4.6 made 210 horsepower in the NPI two valve motor. This motor released in 1995 was the same motor that the Mustang would get as a revised engine in 1996, 97, 98 to replace the long run 5 liter 225 horsepower HO motor. Now Ford has a habit of trying their new engines in their big stepchild cars to see if they'll break before giving them to their favorite sibling, the Mustang GT. But I'm not done yet. The Crown Vic has a police interceptor model dubbed the P71 Police Interceptor. This car had stiffer suspension, rear sway bars, dual exhaust, transmission and oil coolers, and in most cases, upgraded rear gearing, as well as a limited slip to help this car get out of the donut shop and down the road to chase crime. The P71 represents the most durable, best handling, and fastest version of the Panther cars until something special happened in 2003. More on that in a bit. In 1998, the frame was revised and Ford started looking for performance in their now dated body on frame, full size V8 platform. The first major change was a body makeover, which would be the last major redesign of the body itself. The rear suspension was modified to a Watts Link style rear end. This allowed for better handling, but maintained the solid rear axle, despite the market moving to a more refined, independent rear suspension in competitors' cars. The platform also started to move towards a more powerful, now P71 
PI 4.62 valve V8 motor. Some cars had the 210 horsepower NPI motor. Some cars had the PI motor with 235 to 260 horsepower, depending on the application, with the PI motor being prioritized in higher option and police cars. Finally, in 1998, the Crown Vic had the HPP option, which required special 16 inch mesh wheels due to the now larger brakes, which would become standard in the 2003 and forward model. By the way, these wheels look amazing, and if you can find them at the junkyard, they're generally pretty cheap. In 2003, Ford chassis engineer Trevor Skilnick redesigned the frame of the Panther chassis and made changes in manufacturing. That led to a frame torsional rigidity increase of 24%. This also increased resistance to vertical bending by 20%. The 1998 rear suspension was maintained, but with a now wider rear axle. The new frame also had a totally revised front end with a wider track and no shared parts from any other platform. The 2003 Ford Crown Victoria was now the best handling, toughest, most potent, all-around body-on-frame car ever made, and it would have been the fastest, if not for the Mercury Marauder. The Mercury Marauder was Grandpa's hot rod, a police package Mercury Marquis with a Mustang Cobra four-valve motor making over 300 horsepower. It accelerated, it stopped, it turned, but it said Mercury on the front. This wasn't enough to get people excited about Ford's body on frame V8 rear wheel drive platform. And by 2005, the Mercury Marauder was done. They only sold 11,000. Still in 2005, the Town Car, the Marquis, and the Vic were all selling like hotcakes at first. They were known for reliability and cheap maintenance and going lots of miles. That's why you still see them as taxis today. Minor revisions were made through the remainder of the years, but the writing was on the walls for the Panther platform. People just didn't want big body V8 powered cars anymore. The platform sales were dropping and the Panther cars were having a hard time keeping up with the safety requirements of the NHSTA. All of this combined in 2007 to 2011, the mortgage crisis happened and unemployment doubled. This was the highest point of unemployment at any point in the last 30 years. The Panther chassis was finished. Who would buy a car with lesser fuel economy, safety rating, and less handling than cheaper competitors? It was over for the Panther, but still, to this day, it is one of my favorite chassis. Now that we're done with our history lesson, I have some news for you. The Panther ain't gone. <laughs> Okay. In fact, it's being made better than ever. Enthusiasts all over the world are seeking power and handling out of these beasts. These cars are still as cheap as they were before the price hike of all the other cars on the market, and they still ride great, handle well, and they've got that sweet V8 under the hood. There's so many things that you can do to make your Panther a better car, whether you want off-road, on-road, drifting, autocross, or simply a good, safe first car for your teenager to rip fat burnouts in the high school parking lot. Now, if you're planning on building a Panther chassis car, I've got some quick basic facts for you. The 1995 to 1997 Mercury Grand Marquis GS was the lightest Panther ever made. It had a fiberglass trunk and very few options. Combine this with less sheet metal than other cars, it was the absolute lightest Panther ever made. The 2003 plus Crown Victoria P71 police package car was the second most powerful and best handling car at 260 horsepower, but it had other things to make it go fast. And I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. One Lincoln Town Car was made in 1989 from the factory with a 460 big block motor and E4OD four speed transmission with overdrive for George W. Bush as his personal limo. The 5.0 liter V8 motor in the box cars was a low po motor with 140 horsepower from the factory and 150 horsepower in the tow package configuration. But in a 1986 to 1991 Lincoln Town Car Crown Victoria or Mercury Grand Marquis, as long as it had the five liter engine in it in the first place, you can use the same fuel lines, wire harness, and a plug and play computer from a Lincoln Mark 7 in order to run an HL motor in the exact same spot. Ideally, you'll use an 86 to 87 
uh, Panther chassis car as they are a map sensor only. The 5.8 liter Crown Vic police car is slightly desirable as a collector, but the engine itself only made 180 horsepower. So it's not necessarily worth going crazy over unless you want to hold on to it or just brag that you have some special car. Now onto modifications and boy heck do I have a lot of information for you. We are only halfway through this video so far. If you like it, hit the like button. If you have a Panther yourself, tell me what you've got in the comments below. Now, firstly, before you go and modify your car, I want to tell you, I am giving you information to the best of my recollection. If you modify your car, that is your responsibility. I take no responsibility for anything that happens to your car. Cover your butt. The number one question that I see in forums, Facebook posts, or anybody who's looking at a Panther chassis car or just got one is lowering their car. It's the most important thing because it gives you an aggressive stance, a lower center of gravity, and it just feels plain cool. Now, lowering these cars is easy, but you can't just simply type Crown Victoria lowering kit and hit the buy now button. I'll talk about cars without factory rear air suspension first. You have a few options to lower your car. The first and best and most expensive is gonna be coilovers for an air ride kit from ADTR.net. ADTR does the most for the Panther chassis cars, and they're going to have the off-the-shelf options. You can expect about $2,000 for a coilover kit, or double that, or even more for a air ride suspension kit that's a bolt-on from ADTR. Again, these are expensive, but these are also the best riding options for a Vic, Townie, or Marquis. The next and cheapest option is simply cutting the springs that you've got. This is less than ideal, but it works if you don't go too far. The front springs have a tapered end on all cars, and you'll want to cut the non-tapered end of the spring. One coil cut means about 1.5 inches lower. Remember, you can always cut more, but you can't cut less. The rears have two tapered ends on most models. You'll want to cut the top that presses onto the frame of the car. And make sure when you put the springs in, they are under pressure with the shock reinstalled. If the shock is installed and the spring can still bounce around in there, they're at risk of falling out while you're driving in. This is extremely dangerous. Alternatively, you can go to AutoZone and buy rear coil springs for a 1999 Ford Mustang V6 model. Those rear springs will go right in and give you a roughly 1.5 inch drop. And it pairs well with the front cut springs with one coil removed. You can also do 1.5 coils removed from the front for a nice rake look. This is the most ideal in my opinion, as it's the safest and essentially the cheapest at less than $100. One level up from simply cutting your springs or cutting your springs and just throwing Mustang springs in the rear is to use springs from other cars that fit our chassis. This would be the Moog CC80551 coil spring for the front and the Moog CC501 on the rear. The CC501 I think comes from a Chevelle but um, I'll post some pictures of what those cars look like and you can buy that off of Amazon for less than $200. Now, for you baller air ride suspension boys out there, you can simply go under the car and adjust the sensor for the air ride suspension and that will allow the suspension to set at the height you like and you can simply tune the front with coilovers, cut springs, or the Moog CC80551. Now the second most popular thing I see people looking for is horsepower. Now horsepower is slightly difficult to get out of the 4.6, but I've made an entire video about the 4.6 two valve motor and I've got that linked in the description below. So at the end of this video, make sure you go watch that video and check out all of the in-depth information about the 4.6 two valve modular motor that's in your car. The absolute basics are that if you wanna boost it, you Gonna make roughly 450 horsepower whether it's a 5.0 or a 4.6 you're going to cap out around 300 horsepower for the uh, 4.6 or the 5.0 if you're not boosting it the 4.6 you'll want an npi to pi hybrid the 5.0 you'll want a super cammed gt40 5 liter motor with some sort of torque converter in there um, but more on that in a different video i will however talk about Gearing. Now, gearing is the application of power, which is really more important than the actual horsepower you make in the first place. And that leads me to number three, 
Gearing is essentially how easy it is for the engine to rotate the wheels. If you have a two to one axle ratio, that means that the engine is turning the drive shaft two times for one rotation of the tires. This is added mechanical leverage. Every car has a gear reduction in its axle. Most civilian Vicks and Marquis were a 2.73 rear axle ratio. Town cars had a 2.73, 3.03, or 3.31 axle ratio options and police cars were often 3.27 or 3.55 rear axle ratio. That means that the police cars were faster without actually having any more horsepower. If you want to re-gear your Crown Vic, typically you'll choose between a 3.73 or a 4.10 rear axle ratio. Your Crown Vic has a Ford 8.8 rear axle in it, so you can simply search on Google for a Ford 8.8 3.73 um, rear axle ring gear and pinion. Install on that is fairly difficult. You can expect to pay about 800 to 1000 for the install of that alone. 3.73 or 410 is about as far as you wanna go on the street. The higher the rear axle ratio, the more horsepower you have applied. However, you also have the drawback of higher revs on the highway, which means less fuel economy on longer trips. Now tuning is a big part of this too, and that's why we move on to thing number four. There are a few options for a tune on a Panther car. The standard option is the Marty tune. You call Moe's Speed Shop, you pay roughly $600, and then they mail you a tuner with a tune preloaded right on it. It is just that simple. This is typically applied to 2003 and newer vehicles. The Marty Tune, as it's known by enthusiasts, is known to make roughly 10 more horsepower, but that's at all times through the rev range of your car, and it firms up the lazy shifts on your transmission. If you have modifications, you can factor those in as well and add even more power. The factory ECU can be tuned as well at a local speed shop. I had my tune done by Premier Performance here in Sandy, Utah. Tuning is expensive though, so you wanna make sure you've got all your modifications done before you go and get your tune done. That way, the tune can factor all modifications and be as effective as possible. So before you get a tune on your car, that leads me to thing number five, the J mod. This is single-handedly the best modification for increased acceleration on the Panthers made from 1992 to 2007. The 4R70W transmission in these cars is lazy and designed for old souls who want smooth, long shifts and quiet operation. But the 4R70 in these cars is a wolf in sheep's clothing. The J mod or Jerry's mod is a modification that takes an afternoon to do and it firms up your shifts with a simple drill bit. Jerry is the designer of the 4R70 transmission and he knew what to do to really allow this transmission to sing. Higher line pressure, firmer shifts, and a longer service life for less than a few hundred dollars. I'll link a JMod thread in the description as well so you can learn to do that yourself. After all of this is number six and that is wheels. Wheels make a car look good and feel good by proxy. The easiest route is Mustang wheels. Typically any 1996 and onward Mustang wheel is going to fit any 2003 and onward Crown Vic, Lincoln Town Car or Mercury Grand Marquis or Marauder. But the pre-2003 is where it gets funky. The older cars have a narrower track width, which means they have to run more offset, which means those wheels will poke if added to a different car. You'll need wheel spacers to make Mustang wheels fit on these cars. There's a lot of information here, so I'm gonna put it on the screen. Mustang wheels on an aero car will require a 1.5 inch front spacer, 5.114.3 millimeter lug pattern, 70.5 millimeter hub centric. Do not use lug centric spacers here. And a rear two inch, five by 114.3 millimeter lug pattern, 70.5 millimeter center bore, hub centric spacer. If you want a little bit more of flush fitment, you can add a half an inch to that spacer size. Just know that you're risking um, some fender to tire contact and you may want to roll those fenders. For box cars, You'll want a two inch five by 114.3 millimeter lug pattern, 70.5 millimeter center bore, non hub centric spacer for the front because the box cars have a long style hub to center the wheel on. If you get a hub centric spacer here, it will not slide over that long style hub. 
For the rear, you'll want a 2.5 inch 5 by 114.3 millimeter lug pattern, 70.5 millimeter center bore hub centric spacer. Now that you have all of the information you need to really go make your Panther your own, let's make sure you don't forget about the best modification there is, and that's miles. Go out and put some miles on your car. Never forget that driving is what got you into cars in the first place. Let me know in the comments below what Panther car you have and if you've changed anything on it or if you plan to. Make sure you subscribe right there and hit that like button so YouTube knows that you like this video and other people are going to also. Thanks for watching Team Rocket Garage and have a great day.